Thank you. Yes, we are grateful to have you here with us tonight. Um, as this past year, the museum has really been diving into printmaking. It's kind of been our focus, our theme, um, and having your prints here as master printmakers, but also your artists of other medias as well. So it's gonna be exciting for everyone here to see the breadth of your uh, artworks. And then for the audience tonight, the way that the evening is gonna kind of flow, we'll have both artists present their work. Um, they're gonna have a slideshow and then we're gonna open it up for a conversation between the two of them before a Q and A with the audience. So thank you for joining as well. And Enrique. Thank you. So I wonder if we turn off these lights just so the, the images in the back will be a little brighter. They look okay? Okay, well then never mind, never mind. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna start. Uh, it's uh, my honor to be here. Uh, I'm very thankful for the invitation and uh, I feel very lucky to have my work in the museum and I hope uh, you'll have a chance to, to see the exhibition. So. We don't have much time, so I'm gonna go fairly fast with uh, my work. So you're gonna hear the the instant coffee version of my work. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully we'll have time for questions uh, if, as soon as we <clears throat> we finish. So I'm gonna start with uh, my first uh, uh, graphic work I, I did when I moved to this country back in, uh, I, I moved in 1979 and um, I, didn't immigrate to this country. I was imported by my first <laughs> American wife who I met in Mexico City. <laughs> and unfortunately she cannot live there because she got very sick in the countryside. I was working as an economist in the countryside, uh, sort of like an activist. But then we moved here, life changes. I married again, very happily to an artist too. <laughs> Uh, but uh, when I first moved here, I was really afraid of the United States. I was really afraid of moving. Uh, because I did a lot of uh, studies in economy and in uh, the history of Latin America, and most of the democracies or democratic movements were very much destroyed by coup d'etats, uh, all the way from Argentina, Brazil, Central America, even in some, sometimes in Mexico, the Caribbean. Um, anyway, so I felt, wow, it's gonna be very scary to move here. Um, and I don't know if I was right or wrong yet. <laughs> I hope I am wrong. But I, I couldn't help myself because I've been doing political cartooning when I was in Mexico. So the combination of being an activist, I did also support for Nicaragua in the 80s when there was a hope for the revolution. Unfortunately, that changed. And uh, it's uh, turning to a dictatorship, unfortunately. But at the time, I started doing things like this. I was involved. Uh, in 19, this is 1984, I was an undergrad at the San Francisco Art Institute. So this, this is a seven by seven feet drawing, a charcoal on paper. It got destroyed uh, the first time I saw it. It was uh, part of an exhibition against intervention in Central America organized by art critic in New York, Lucy Lipart and Salvadorian poet, poets. So I did this specifically for that show, but then as soon as I exhibit this work in the Mission District, the Latino District, somebody got really offended with Ronald Reagan and they turned the pages. And the, the little figure is uh, Henry Kissinger. So I had to make my second version of it. And um, I'm very much into forgeries. So I tried to do a little forgery of my own work. <laughs> and uh, so I did as much as possible a rendering of the first uh, version, and I hope it's not too dark. I see it a little dark in the laptop, but um, it, it, it's, uh, it has some torns on the side, And uh, but I even copy the erasing marks. I try to do as much as possible the, the same thing. So now I sit at the collection of the San Jose Museum of Art in the Bay Area. So, but I decided to follow up on a series of these charcoal drawings. Uh, this is after a painting by a German immigrant, um, a Karl Weimer, uh, he changed his name to Charles Weimer, is the abduction of Daniel Boone's daughter by the Indians. That's the title <laughs> of the work. Um, so I decided to make my own version of that. 
with the Border Patrol, the original Border Patrol with Native <laughs> Americans. I did another version. I was uh, I'm going to put a different Donald here, but I am sick and tired of his face. So I decided to put an avatar, so Donald Duck, uh, as the daughter of uh, Daniel Boone. <laughs> and I decided a mix of Native American characters all the way from the West Coast to Mexico and, and the Southwest. But anyway, I have done paintings uh, of the same image, uh, like this one. Um, and I showed this one uh, in New York uh, last year, so I got a nice review, thankfully. But anyway, I have done a lot of uh, this kind of imagery. This is another big charcoal drawing at the De Rosa. And it's hard to see in the in the projection, but in the middle finger, you might read, if you get close to the drawing, it will read um, uh, English only. This one is called When Paradise Arrive, and it's a picture of like, uh, Somebody who's been displaced from their land. It could be a Native American, or could be an immigrant, or uh, so it, I, I left that open. So I'm going to go back to the work you will see here. Um, this is uh, a version of my own uh, print based on Goya's prints. This is two printmakers that I really like: Posada, who developed this character, the Katrina, the skeleton lady, or the bourgeois. Uh, rich lady, but as a skeleton. And um, she is introducing Goya and Posada to each other after death uh, in a reign of bulls. And I did a little self-portrait as a little kid with a Mexican mask. And I always put a, a rubber stamp on the bottom uh, because uh, the fascist government of Franco put rubber stamps in the prints of Goya's uh, in the original images. Anyway, so this was the very first one I did as an undergrad at the San Francisco Art Institute back in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was president. It was called, it's called Contra el Bien General. And the funny thing is that the former president called himself uh, a Contra. So it was great. It had the same word in the same print. So you will see this one. And I have to say um, the aqua tint in, I, I, well, I have to say how many things are wrong with my prints compared to Goya's, a uh, little intimidating being next to the, my <laughs> idol. And so I, I wouldn't spend much time or any time saying, telling you what's wrong with my prints. But I, I have a disclaimer, which you're gonna see in, in upcoming prints. This is um, sort of like a Yang and Jing uh, with a Disney character on the left, uh, lower left. And it's uh, based on, you know, when you go to Disney World, this says, welcome to the happiest place on earth. And for me, the unhappiest place on earth is war. Uh, so this is, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is a, uh, something that haunts humanity. And today, you know, I, guess, I don't want to spend my time talking about the, the horrendous wars that are happening right now. Uh, we could talk about it later, but, um, but in any case, it's sort of like a yin and yang. Uh, you know, the, 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 the humor that is not funny, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about humor in my work as a, as a form of defense against the, the, the worst circumstances for protection of your, your own sanity, basically. So that's the only, the only way I use humor. In this one, the rubber stamp uh, reads, this is not a test. And I assume uh, all of us here are aware or used to, you know, when we have a test on TV. Um, this is my disclaimer. This is uh, my self-portrait with Goya's hat, which is way too big for me. So that, then I gave my permission to make my prints not as good as <laughs> Goya's. Uh, so, um, but they have the actual, I could tell you what's wrong with my prints. My aqua tint was overprinted, so they're a little lighter than Goya's aqua tint. Although my earlier prints were as rich as Goya's. Uh, but they got overprinted. My, my, I was a student, so I used zinc because I didn't have money to buy copper, uh, which would have lasted a bigger edition of the aqua tint. So my prints next to Goya's, embarrassingly, the, the aqua tint is lighter than <laughs> Goya's prints. But in my disclaimer, like this one, my aqua tint is richer than Goya's print. <laughs> and that print has the same problem as mine. It got overprinted. <laughs> so that's why it's because the original Goya is richer too. Anyway, 
These are my own versions of that. The, the Sleep of Reason produces monsters, except, you know, Goya put these bats and owls and a, a, and, and a cat. And those are not scary anymore. You know, bats and owls are endangered species, and I love cats. So I decided to put something more scary, you know, like a stealth bomber, uh, <laughs> a, a, you know, tomahawk missiles, uh, <laughs> nuclear plants, and there is a drum with a nuclear waste in the rubber, rubber stamp. A few years later, uh, I did another version of that uh, with my cat Lulu or cat Lulu. As a little devil, she was a little lovely monster that used to run around our house pretty much flying all over. But anyway, so yeah, this is a title is What a Saster Can Do. Uh, it's just the militarization of police. Uh, these are more recent. This is a QAnon, and you know, uh, people believing in all these consp conspiracy theories. As uh, a skull character with a Mickey Mouse hat. <laughs> this another one, Donald, is, you know, screaming uh, demagoguery. Um, what a golden beak with a KKK character on the bottom. I mean, you can see it's like a, I think I put like a little duck, KKK. Oh. So this is from the Proverbios, an uh, upside down tank oppressing people on the bottom. Uh, this is uh, people recently immigrants, uh, but hanging uh, from a tree, uh, protecting themselves from maybe the border patrol, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, so this is my studio, and uh, a friend of mine made this composition, invited me to go to work in Magnolia Editions. <laughs> so we went and made this print. This is a digital print on metal or an aluminum uh, oxidized and it's my DNA self-portrait because I have DNA from Native Americans especially 51% they have 38% Spanish the other 11% I'm Jewish Ashkenazi I am Arab I am uh, Southern Asian Eastern Asian uh, and my genes get along with each other and uh, I otherwise I'll be dead and I wonder if humanity has the same problem. We, we, if we don't get along, we're just gonna die as species, you know, because it's like all, the, all of us have some DNA from different places, even if it's not maybe uh, the same race or ethnicity, maybe different tribes that were to used to kill each other and then, but the, your ancestors also mix with each other and they live in peace in your, in your DNA. So anyway, I'm gonna move fast. This is uh, Hong Liu, a good good friend of mine. A few uh, months before she passed away, unfortunately, mm -hmm. she had a major retrospective at the Smithsonian right after this, which unfortunately she was not able to to attend. Um, she passed away from uh, pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. This is Ira Farnsworth in in their studio printing one of my codices with Talula and myself, and this was during COVID which was a good way to spend more time. I do like look alike pre-Columbian books like these ones. And uh, this one is very hard to see because you probably see it very small, but this is what we did. It's some handmade paper from indigenous uh, handmade papers in Mexico, it's a mate. And uh, it's a, a whole collage of imagery. Uh, there's a little girl fighting a Nazi, neo-Nazi character on the right hand. That's the, the grandmother, the, the little granny of King Awisote, which was an Aztec king who expanded the Aztec empire. And she's fighting against uh, this fascist character. And that's the granny when she was a little girl. She was very mostly. It was like Captain America, but she's uh, Captain Mexico. Anyway, so I guess we run pretty much out of time. One more minute, and so this is the most uh, recent codex after the Mayan uh, book in Mexico City, Codex Mexico City. And this is based on uh, catechist uh, uh, indigenous books. Uh, they're called the Codex Testerianos, and it's my contemporary version with images <laughs> of pollution, war, uh, if stereo ethnic stereotypes, cultural collisions. Uh, 
So this is life at the border of language. And the end. Thank you. So we barely made it on time. Thank you. And I hope we can hear a little more in the conversation about the codices as well. Um, but with time, we're going to pass it over to Robin. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, take it away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I have to say, even before we start, that I'm really grateful and thankful that you're here because part of my intention in being an artist is after I have the luxury of trying to express and manifest my experience, my thoughts, my ideas, my dreams, my pain, there's that component of connecting with other people. So I feel that every time I have the wonderful opportunity to present my work or be a witness to somebody else presenting my work, it's that uh, other part of the call and response reality and it creates a, a greater sense of humanity. So thank you, thank you for being here. And I understand there are quite a few printmakers here and that is like really exciting for me. So um, I guess I'll start and uh, Monica will let me know when I'm running out of time because I could talk forever and she'll just cue me. Um, she'll be forwarding the slides. Um, I came up with this and is Cara Maria here somewhere? Uh, and it turns out that Enrique's wife is a f fellow colleague of mine at the uh, Clark Hewlings Fund for Artists. And we had to, as one of our first assignments in a one or two year uh, exploration of building our careers, come up with a one sentence, quote, brand statement. So mine is, let's raise our racial IQ with art. So Cara, who is a wonderful artist in her own right, I just wanted to let you know that. So we can advance, Monica. I thought it might be a nice idea just to kind of give you a sense of this part of my studio, because often people are looking at artwork and they're seeing the final product of a, a very long involved process. And our studios, of course, are sacred spaces and we have relationships to our tools, our materials, our equipment, and the space, and the way that we move around the space. So you can go on to the next slide. It's another area in my studio. And so move ahead, Monica. This is uh, the image on my, I don't know if we have the same right left orientation, but the image on the on my right is the piece that is in the exhibition of the acquisition from Jean and Bob Steele. It's, um, they damaged us more, the Katrina. And the image on the, which is a, a silk screen, a photographic silk screen. And the version on the left is the original stencil monoprint that I created in those five or six days when many of us were glued to the TV, looking at the horror of the Hurricane Katrina um, aftermath and challenge. So this was a, one of the few times that I've created a piece for a specific, as response to a specific historic event. And I felt that I was successful in portraying the feeling that I had that we will, oh, we will surpass this horror, this brutalization, and we will come up it valiant as a phoenix rises. But to be honest with you, the process of creating it was really very painful because I was crying the whole time that I was creating the image because uh, of a, my emotional response to the event itself. So I was like in the studio cutting my stencils and inking them and like I could barely see at times because of the tears. You could go on to the next one, Monica, thank you. I'm gonna um, present a couple of works from a series that I created called Our Social Skin, and I made 10. At the time I did this, we had 10 federal holidays. Now we have 11 because we added Juneteenth. But I thought, let me just figure out, you know, how the United States as a nation presents itself 
through its federal holidays. So I created one um, book in an edition of five for each of our 10 holidays. And each holiday was designed around an article of clothing that I thought was appropriate for that holiday. And they're engineered books that combine painting, printmaking, sewing, um, the use of metals, ma magnets, uh, fabric, paper, drawing. So the whole idea is like, how do we deal with the fact that we're presenting a diluted version of the real history of this country through these federal holidays. So we can advance to the next slide. And this is my Martin Luther King Jr. Day book, and it opens out. And there are elements from the civil rights movement of the 1960s in it. They're juxtaposed against recent demonstrations of um, cries for attention to injustice and inequity. And I'm sure many of you remember the poster, I Am a Man, and the fact that black men had to have a poster saying, I am declaring their humanity and their uh, reality as men. It, it, kind of tells you something about the society. And this book is in the shape of a pastor's robe. So we can go on to the next one. Um, I was researching the United States Armed Forces and found out that now in the armed forces, Sikhs can cover their heads, uh, Jews can wear yarmulkes, you can have dreadlocks if they're in a uh, all the same length in a what is considered an orderly fashion. Um, indigenous Americans can go to ceremonies and events in their full regalia if they want. And I thought, you know, I, I don't think that that many Americans realize how diverse the armed forces is. There's also a very prominent presence of women in the armed forces now. I also researched how Memorial Day, this is the Memorial Day um, book, and it's in the shape of a camouflage vest, and it has components that open and close. So I, I, I learn a lot when I do research for my work, and we can advance to the next slide. Um, I did a series of pieces that I called um, USA, the United States of Anxiety, and I started by looking at neighborhoods in Detroit where people have, remember the 2007, 2008 economic meltdown? Was that, was it 2008, I believe? Yeah, um, and I thought a lot about how is this really affecting the psyche of the American populace, the fact that the dream or the deluded expectation that we have to have a, solid middle-class life in which you can be prosperous, you can send your children to school, you can take care of your parents, you can have appropriate health care and transportation, live in a community. And for many people, that was just completely destroyed um, when they lost their homes. And I think that a lot of people who previously did not really realize how the uh, corporate uh, world functions in a very vicious way in the society to manipulate the our access or lack of access to resources. So my whole idea was the reason that I was focusing on Detroit was because I was seeing that as um, the American car industry and how um, the Ford car and those huge manufacturing plants were very much a basis of the middle class life. And in addition, Detroit is a one of those focal points for prosperous African American life and culture and economy. So my idea was to portray the fact that we pretend or present this uh, image that we are 
middle class, we're prosperous, we're anchored, but everything is like a little like chueco, like a little off kilter. So we can advance to the next image, Monica. Okay, oh, and here's a, um, equal under the law with a question mark, which kind of says it all. This is a, clearly an African-American person. And the way that I develop these images is that the, the pieces are irregular in shape and they're about maybe around 42 by 42 inches in dimension. But I start with a colored pencil portrait, which I digitally interface with, um, images of textural effects and stencil monoprints that I've made. And then I have them printed as large format archival inkjet prints. And then I draw and paint on top of that. So you can go to the next one. And this one is, I think uh, some of you will remember when people were very uh, upset to find out that they are putting children in cages at the border. Uh, uh, of Mexico and the United States. So this is another one. Um, and we can advance to the next one. These are my more recent works that are kind of calling out the fact that everybody is suffering. Everybody who has come to the United States under different conditions at some point in history were ostracized or brutalized or victimized. And I found some uh, information about signs that used to be in New York City uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in apartment buildings that would have signs like no Chinese allowed, Irish not welcome, just to remind us all that we, all of us at some point have been in that place of being outsiders. So we can move to the next one. And these pieces are, as you might remember in one of the images of my studio, are 50 inches by 30 inches. So this whole approach of doing these small colored pencil drawings and then digitally collaging them and having them printed out is my way of creating larger works because physically I can't um, manage to do that. So we can move to the next slide. This is um, these. This is part of my <laughs> approach to masking, and these were done during those COVID years. And my question in this particular piece is okay, because being a New Yorker, gentrification is a conversation that is everywhere at all times. And I'm thinking that okay, is a is a a young African American student who's family earns $450,000 a year, moves into Harlem, is she a gentrifier? Or is a, a, a elderly Caucasian woman who lives on a very modest income who moves into a Latino neighborhood, is she a gentrifier? Just trying to question and turn a lot of our assumptions about people's uh, station and circumstances in life in a way that we can really see the humanity in each other. So, Monica, do we still have time? Uh, we're done? Okay. So this I'll just mention is one of the COVID pieces where I use the idea of um, the essential workers being the people who really kept the society moving and together during COVID. And aside from the people in the medical profession, a lot of the people, store clerks or truck drivers, are people who live in a very modest way and they're sort of like throwaways in the society, but they really were and are our heroes. So the idea here was to show that everybody was wearing a mask, but we're all interconnected. And in the images, there are ropes and pathways and maps to kind of um, highlight the idea that we are all moving through society in a orchestrated way where we're interdependent on each other. So I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, this is Anya. Is this on? Check. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good. Thank you. It's kind of it's such a tough job to interrupt or to. Uh, bring things uh, to a close this quickly. 
for, for your presentations. We're moving on to the next part, which is a conversation between both artists. Um, I think there's a lot that they can say, and there's a lot more that we can learn from your works. So I'm going to take a little bit more of a backseat on this. And, um, and with this, I was considering starting the conversation, talking a little bit more about the printmaking techniques as you've gone through things. Um, especially what we have in our gallery with the etchings and aquatints and seeing your artwork as it goes to lithograph or acry acrylic, both kind of go into these book narratives. So do you want to talk a little bit about the process? And then you can take the conversation as it flows from there. So before we start, Monica, do you want to forward it so we can get to the loop? <laughs> yes. Thank you. We rehearsed this, guys. So we just want to make sure we're giving you the best presentation possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're gonna put my glasses to look more cool. Uh, no, actually, the lights uh, kind of here. Okay, but um, uh, well, I I want to work. I want to talk about the work in the exhibition here because most of the work I have been showing, you might not be able to see it in person. But um, uh, the works in the exhibition here were my thesis work for my uh, graduate program at UC Berkeley. But they got published 20 years later. So uh, I didn't have the means to make an edition of them. I did a lot of artist proofs myself. And that's why the aqua thing got a little weaker. But eventually, uh, somebody really liked them and decided to make an edition 20 years later in 2003. So, um, but what attracted me to Goya's print was um, a, the fact that Somebody was telling me, the filmmaker, I forgot his name, that, that he felt it was like a deja vu uh, to see my work next to the Goyas. And I said, well, the deja vu is history. Um, it, history repeats itself. Um, you know, Karl Marx say that history repeats twice, first as a tragedy, the second time as a farce. And I thought he was totally wrong. I, I think it was first time as a tragedy and the second time even as a worse tragedy because it seems like we didn't learn from the first time. And in Mexico, we have a popular saying that goes uh, to, that says that uh, humans are the only animals that trip twice in the same rock or, or with the same rock. And that happens a lot. Um, but uh, for me, conflict is something that exists and will exist among people forever. Why? Because we are very diversified. We are uh, people, uh, we're the uh, same species, but we have different languages, we have different nationalities, we have different religions, uh, we have different genders, different social classes, economic classes, uh, you name it. Uh, and conflict happens naturally as part of history, part of the the the, the progress of you know, when, when conflicts get resolved, we progress, we move forward. But violence, war, uh, the only thing that they, it does is delay the resolution of conflict. The, the, the longer the violence, the longer the resolution of conflict uh, takes. At the end, people have to sit with each other and negotiate and accept uh, to live in peace with each other. But it seems like uh, it takes forever to, to learn that. So with my work here, I hope uh, people have a, at least a, a little bit of thought-provoking experience, history that repeats itself, and violence. Somebody say also that uh, the war was the, the politics by other means. Wrong. <laughs> it's just... It's just that, that people just don't want to resolve the issues until you know, like, gets really bloody. But um, but eventually, I hope things change. Otherwise, it, we're just going to join the dinosaurs in the endangered species. <laughs> so that's all I will have to say about my work. I don't want to take too much time because Robin, I'm sure, has a, a lot of uh, other things to say about her work in the show. Which, by the way, I love it. I love it, Robin. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, and then feel free to answer and then ask questions of each other as questions may arise um, and what insights you see in each other's work as well. 
Well, I guess my big obsession is trying to find ways to be a witness for other people's reality. And I think that um, when we acknowledge other people's truth, we are doing the best that we can to foster a sense of community and interconnectedness. And I firmly am convinced that most of the problems that we have in society are because people are isolated or not aware of other people's challenges or not um, empathetic. And my imagery is very layered because I see life as a very complex construct and interaction of many different realities going on all at once. And um, it's interesting to see that Enrique and I both have a very similar understanding of the world and society, and how societies and people and different demographics, which are defined by different racial, ethnic, cultural, national, uh, political, or spiritual, religious characteristics, create this tension. And one of the things I wanted to ask you uh, well, I have a million questions I could ask you, Enrique, but the question that I want to focus on right now is, have you ever experienced a situation where somebody uh, looking at your work shifted or expanded their understanding of society or embraced um, something or someone that they previously felt uh, at a discord with or polarization? Yes, but I, we could talk like two hours about it. <laughs> yeah. But I will say as fast as I can, the experience I had, I, I, I hope I could make it really brief. Uh, when somebody destroyed one of my works, uh, one of my codices was destroyed in 2010 in Colorado when I was uh, part of a group exhibition of prints uh, by Bad Shark, uh, who's the publisher of my codices, uh, lithographic codices. And um, I did a book in 2002 to... Uh, critique and 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 to express my anxieties and 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 my vision of but mostly my 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 how can I say being upset with the Catholic Church uh, for not doing anything to resolve the sexual abuse of children women and young men in the church which has taken place for centuries uh, but in 2002, the Boston Globe did a big expose of uh, a, a priest in the church um, if, having a history of sexual abuse of uh, children. But also the fact that the church is very hypocritical, discriminating against same-sex marriage, uh, being a, a militant uh, against birth control for women, and... Um, and on the other hand, doing nothing to resolve the sexual abuse in the church. So I have nothing against people who, who are believers. I, uh, a, the, uh, my work has nothing to do against people who believe in that. I, I have worked with religious groups, in solidarity groups, with Central America, in literacy campaigns. I'm not religious. But anyways, to your response to your question, uh, somebody destroyed the work. My work was on Fox News. That's a great review. So, so somebody came all the way from Montana. She drove an 18-wheeler. She was a truck driver, drove all the way to Colorado, to Loveland, the Loveland Museum. Great name. I love the place, actually. And with a crowbar, destroyed the frame and turned the, the print. It was the misadventures of the romantic cannibals. And uh, I mix images, religious images, with Mexican uh, comics of soft porn books. And in my version of pre-Columbian books, that's how pre-Columbian indigenous cultures express in pictograms a statement. They, they were non-literacy uh, literacies, non-alphabetic or non-phonetic literacies. So I express corruption that way. So there was a picket line outside, you know, including that they, they wanted to take down other works of mine. And a pastor asked me, what did I mean with my work? 
So he, I explained to him what I'm explaining to you, and he thanked me. He said, thank you for your thoughtful explanation. If you ever come to Colorado, don't, um, it, it would be an honor to meet you. <laughs> so I wrote him right away. He said, I wish all Christians were like you. So we became, you know, instant friends. And, uh, but he got attacked online too. I got a lot of death threats myself. I, he also did for not joining the picket line. I, he, his house was put online. This is in 2010, all this organized by the Tea Party. And I got really scared. But um, it, at first I thought, oh, this is great. Somebody destroyed my work. Uh, I will invite her to every opening because I got you know, publicity all the way to the New York Times. In the <laughs> but now it got really scary. But I thought somebody should have tell her that this was a print. It's a multiple original. So <laughs> she didn't have to come all the way from Montana to Colorado to destroy it. Or change the channel because she got upset with Fox News. But anyway, so, but I explained this to the pastor. The pastor didn't join the picket line. We became really good friends. Over time, the, the thing got calm. And he asked me if I will be willing to do a painting of Jesus for his church. And I'm not religious. I, I told him I am not religious, but he risked his life. And I say, I will do it if your congregation accepts it, for, accepts it from me. And I thought, they're not going to accept it because I, you know, I'm the devil. Uh, so, uh, but they did accept. And so I had to do it. So I did a big painting of Jesus in a resurrection. I looked for Mexican colonial paintings. I, I looked for Dutch paintings. And I put a big banner that says love, used to remind Christians that Christ was about love, not about hate. So and they love it. They, I sent it to them. They put it up. And then and they pay for the shipping. So, was, uh, But then they invited me to go to the opening. And I got really terrified of going there. I had like a pain in my stomach just thinking about going there because I thought it's Colorado. They're going to have a two first. They're going to kill the pastor and kill me with one bullet. Uh, you know, so, uh, but I went because I, I have to take responsibility for my work. They put guards on my side. I feel like a rock star. So that was nice. And they only wanted, nobody talked to me about God. Nobody wanted to convert me into Christianity. And, uh, it was beautiful. It was the most beautiful experience I have as a printmaker. And I'm very sorry this was such a long answer. <laughs> but yes, somebody changed their mind. He said, that's not my Jesus. Said, You're right. That's not Jesus. That's a collage. So uh, it, it worked that So, But now it's my turn to ask <laughs> Robin <laughs> a question. <laughs> uh, so, 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 Robin, um, you touch very profound uh, uh, issues that affect all of us in this country. Uh, and through your own experiences or through empathy uh, 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 from other experiences. So um, my question to you is, what do you uh, hope your personal projection in your work uh, conveying to the viewer, what would you love to see in the audience when they see your work? And have you experienced maybe a similar question? Have you experienced somebody telling you, you, you made me feel this when I saw your work? And mm -hmm. what, what do you, do, do you, envision and what has been your experience with it, with your work and, mm -hmm. and the audience? Hmm. <laughs> um, I hope it's not too difficult. I, I, no, it, it's not that it's difficult. It, it, I'm always reminding myself that we all have references that are very unique and personal to our experience. And I truly do believe that there are commonalities between just about everybody, that if we were able to know 
the particulars of other people's, primarily their challenges and their pain, our understanding of the construct of society would be more open and we would touch inside our basic fundamental humanity. Um, all of this comes because I um, am the child of my dad was an African Caribbean from Barbados, a, an Episcopalian family. And my mom is the daughter of Russian Jews from Ukraine. And when I was growing up in New York, most people did not know anything about my racial cultural heritage. And because I've always been very curious, <laughs> I was and still am often the only one in some group of people. And I started to see very young that people, when they feel that you are part of them, you start to see what threatens them or what they're afraid of in other people. So I was and still am to a certain degree kind of like a fly on the wall witness of other people's fears. And it's a, it's a, a kind of a double-edged reality where there's a lot of beauty in it and there's a lot of real pain in it. And I, well, being Jewish, of course, I'm obsessed with the idea of everybody needs a witness. But also as a person who's an African-American and a, per a brown-skinned person who moves throughout society, <laughs> also see that people don't know if I'm Israeli or Lebanese or Italian. Or, and it's interesting to um, just watch people's reactions to my presence. And I think that what I want to convey, Enrique, is the fact that when you know the specifics of a person's journey or their heritage and the challenges that their people have experienced, you connect on a very visceral level. And the labels that you use or the assumptions that you have about those other people, them, start to melt away. And I think, I mean, my family, I think my family thinks like I'm, I'm, I'm like totally a softy because I truly do believe that it, it is possible to get to a point where you can connect with people that are completely convinced that you're the bad guy. Because I, I do believe that Americans are not really, we do not teach ourselves, we do not research, we do not really pay attention to the true history of the complex diversity of our populace. And it's um, a very frightening reality because people, we, we all have our main focal points and we filter things through them. So if you're a fundamentalist, I don't think you wake up in the morning saying, okay, I hate all brown skinned people and I wanna murder all the immigrants. I think you just think that my main issue is being an anti-abortionist and so everything else on the platform, I'm just gonna go with that flow. But I know from my own experience that if my car breaks down, the guy in around the corner who voted for Trump will be the first one to come and help me get that car together. So I really do think that there, I need to leave open space and hope and a breath to allow those connections between one individual and another who are, in terms of the categories and labels that we use, are polarized to come together. So that's about the best I can do right now with that. <laughs> 
Is it working again? Okay, wonderful. Yeah. All right. So we've come. We've gone a little bit over um, with this for this evening. It's about eight eight o'clock now. Um, we can have maybe a couple questions from the audience if you don't mind staying a little longer. Uh, and it's opened up. Thank you so much, both of you, for. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. It is. There's so much that we can continue to hear, and I can tell there's a lot more that needs to be said and can be said. Um, but for the audience to kind of jump into the Q&A, does anyone have a question or, or a thought that they would like to raise their hand? Ask, ask now. Now, you know you have to ask something, because if you don't, we're going to think that we were really yes, boring. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going to repeat through the mic so everyone can hear. I think it's maybe as Gandhi will say, we we are we, we have to be the change we want. We have to start with ourselves. Um, one of my favorite um, news that I read in the last few years was um, right after the former president was elected in 2017, uh, a mosque in Texas, in the town of Victoria in 2017, was burned. It was the only single mosque in the town. But the local um, synagogue offered their space for the Muslim uh, community to worship there. And they accepted. And I thought that was just really beautiful. The same year, a month later, in in um, a outside of St. Louis in Missouri, uh, in the city university uh, cemetery, there was a Jewish cemetery that the tombstones got vandalized completely. So guess who helped that Jewish community to raise money for uh, repairing the tombstones? The Muslim community from Texas. So they collaborated with each other. and. From there until today, in the war situation, like in Gaza, which is, uh, I, I have Jewish relatives myself. I, I, I have a nephew who converted and married a wonderful Jewish Mexican woman. They live in Florida. They have three daughters. I love them. They're very progressive. They went to the Women's March the day after Trump was elected, you know, all these things. And then I have Muslim friends. I have students of mine. I, I love that, that, that they're, uh, if not necessarily religious, they're more Islamic. Um, and I love it. And so this war turns my, my guts when I see it. But within uh, Israel, they, there are groups that are Palestinians who live in Israel with Jewish people who live within Israel fighting the war, fighting for peace. In the U.S., there is like uh, these groups in New York, if not now, when, or Jewish for Peace, working with Arab groups uh, and, and Palestinian Americans together to pressure Biden to stop sending, uh, you know, support for, for the military. And everybody is in pain with what happened to in Israel, too. Uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish uh, brothers and sisters who got terrified on October 7. Everybody has empathy. But this war has gone beyond defending itself. The, 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 the ends do not justify the means in these cases. Uh, when the means are inhuman, then it disconnects with, with any positive. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to talk the, the whole thing. My whole point is, even when the, the worst circumstances for peace seems to be so dark, there is hope. To me, the hope is all these people that work together when in other places they're in conflict. 
So that means we, we have some breaches that we just need to keep improving. And right now there's plenty of political pressure in Europe, in everywhere, and I hope peace will, will come. There are no formulas. I wish there was a formula. I don't have the answer. I also have more questions, but I feel inspired by some beautiful people who work with each other, which cross. It's like the pastor and me. We came from very, you know, I, I'm not religious. I send them a picture of all the portraits of Christ from different countries in the world, like 40 in the same picture. The, there is a Chinese uh, Jesus, that looks totally Chinese, a Japanese, it looks like a Ukiyo-e print. I have a Mexican Jesus, looks very indigenous. There's a Russian Jesus with red hair. There's an African Jesus from Ethiopia, this black. Uh, there is the American version, that blonde with blue eyes, you know. So, it, it, so it, it's uh, like that. But and and I and I thought there, I say I'm not gonna paint a Jesus is for real, but I still will do it, and I did it, and I love it, and until to, today, we are very good friends. The director of the museum, by the way, got promoted. She got tons of money because she stood her ground, defended the exhibition, and she got a lot of donations from, from her uh, membership of the museum, the Loveland Museum. And now she's city council member that oversees all the cultural institutions of Loveland. The pastor got promoted to the head pastor of his congregation, the Resurrection Fellowship, Jonathan Wiggins, that's his name, and Susan Eisen is the curator from the Loveland Museum. So we sometimes have lunch together. So a non-religious person, a religious person, and an art curator. I, that's, to me, that's the hope. It might not change overnight, but, but if not, I mean, if not now, when? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um. Thank you for your question. That was, I'm sorry, it's such a long answer. But does that mean? I, I would, I saw one here, and then I'll take you next. Okay. Yes, well. yes. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. So the question was um, doing an art piece that would represent the first day of peace and what that looks like to you. Maybe Robin? I think most of us have that sense inside ourselves that this morning when I wake up is my first day of peace. Otherwise, we would all be in the manicomio, in the insane asylum. <laughs> so I, th I think it's something within that we have to develop in terms of having a, an international global day of peace. My biggest suggestion is for us to all say, next Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., we are not spending any money, period, until they stop fighting, period. Then we will see some real change. Because the background of all this is about money and about territory and who is going to control the natural resources of this planet. And I think once we get past our delusion about what democracy is and realize who is really behind all of this pain and heartache and, and we pay attention to our elected representatives and obligate them to do what they say, we can really make some change. But we have gotten used to traveling exploring, taking Tai Chi classes, ceramic classes, um, bettering ourselves, exploring the universe, and we really haven't done our job 
to explain and pass on to our children and grandchildren how this whole thing functions. So that would be my <laughs> that would be my suggestion to get to that first day of global peace. Yeah. And I'll take I had this this will be our last question for for this evening. Okay, oh. and the print with Mickey Mouse and Ronald Reagan. What well, does the foot mean in that bucket? It's just the the mixing for the for the paint, <laughs> which is blood. Uh, it's a very gory I imagery, and uh, it's uh, maybe a way uh, for me to show the absurdity of uh, somebody uh, having. The exporting violence, uh, trying to pro uh, uh, putting people who were with big hopes in Nicaragua at the time, and and later in El Salvador, you know, like there was uh, also, uh, also Bishop uh, Romero, who got killed by American soldiers uh, or Ameri uh, soldiers trained by the Americans, and so that absurdity is very most, mostly symbolic. And my sense of humor comes from maybe not being exposed to the trauma myself. If I had been somebody victim of trauma, I probably would not be painting that. And I learned that from a student of mine in a community college when I used to teach before I was where I am at uh, Cal State University at the time. Uh, I have students from all ages. One of them was uh, a survivor of the Holocaust, Eva. And um, it, one day she make an etching. I was teaching etching. She made a beautiful etching with figures kind of dancing in color. And say, Eva, what is that? And she told me, these are people living in concentration camps. And I said, wow. I said, I say, do you want to put like maybe uh, something that's clear that it's a concentration camp, maybe uh, some barbed wire or something? And she said, no, no, I never want to see it. And I apologized to her because I said, yes, she lived through trauma. She cannot. She cannot see it again. I have the privilege of being distant from trauma. Although, like Robin, I, am, I have empathy with a lot of people who have gone through that. And thankfully, I am able to deal with the imagery with some sense of humor. And for me, humor is something cultural that we have in Mexico. It's something that maybe uh, Andre Breton thought that Mexico was a surrealist country. If Mexico was just a country that didn't think of itself as surrealism. But it has a similar definition of humor. Humor in my work, and as well as many people that I know where I'm coming from, and maybe people in this country as well, because there's no borders for me, is humor uh, in, in general is, a, the, my kind of humor is the triumph of pleasure over pain under the worst circumstances for pleasure. It's like a triumph of the human spirit where it's like the Buddhist, when you smile, when you are meditating and you smile, you feel better. So I try to distance myself. It's not that I'm trying to um, to to minimize the, the the violence, but rather to create a layer of protection from a distance that is maybe like a nightmarish humor. And I hope people still don't have the trauma to not be able to see my work. But it's uh, something that I acknowledge, uh, and I feel privileged that I could deal with that. I'm sorry it spent so long. I'm sorry, I hope I answered your question. But thank you for your question. It's very important. Thank you. Um, you said your answer for supposedly to be humorous. <laughs> and we are out of time for this evening. Um, so we are wrapping it up. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yes. I hope if you've gone through the galleries, um, go through it again. Perhaps you can look at the artwork with new eyes. Um, I even know, Robin, when you were talking about your art piece and crying through it, I can see it through um, the image. So do enjoy. Go check those out. If anyone is interested um, in learning more about printmaking, I know we have a lot of printmakers here. 
but we also do have art classes um, at the art school and they start in April. So there is mono printing and different printmaking styles that will begin then. And um, great to see so many printmakers and Honolulu printmakers out here as well. And thank you. Thank you all. Thank you both as well so much. <laughs>